free. Mr. Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. So this isn't a great solution here. And, and Deb and Linda were kind of frustrated with their result, and they're going to talk to you about that. And that's why they called uh, the Center for Medicare Advocacy. And, they, they, who, who, and those, the folks kind of chortled and said, oh, yeah, you're right. That's what's happening nationally. And so none of that is good news. And by the way, in, in terms of all of this work, we are not, we, the lawyers, are not your competitors for this work. We do not want to be doing these appeals. That is not financially sensible for our clients because the, the, uh, the whole appeal process through Medicare is primarily a paper process based on medical information. We do paper. We don't do medicine, right? You folks get all the, the, termin the terminology. You're the right people to be doing this. We should be feeding cases to you and not vice versa, right? And, or, or we should be working closely with you. We at NALA, the, the elder law attorneys that do a lot of this should be working closely with you to figure out how all of this stuff goes. So there is the, the, the issues. No provider obligation to provide services, right? Services, are the, whether the services are needed are based on a doctor's opinion. Who's doctor when you're at the nursing home, right? You're having, getting a, you're having a lot of trouble finding doctors at the nursing home saying that these patients really need a program of services which would be covered under GEMO, right? I don't know if there's a conflict there, but it's really hard, right? But, but this gets to, I think, kind of the heart of it. I think over this period of time, the last nine months that I've been really kind of working a lot on this, we've just come to appreciate it is our understanding now that the issue is really all about this. It's about the low rug rates, that the, that that the services that are, be, that, that at least the services that the VNAs and the, and the nursing homes have been talking about providing to GMO, um, to, to people who would be, uh, would be classified under GMO, are services for which they're getting reimbursed at such a low rate that they don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. They don't want to figure out a process for having them deny and, and you appeal so that eventually the service, and then they'll provide the services temporarily, and then the services are going to get reimbursed. Because if they get if they provide the services temporar temporarily and charge your cl clients on private pay, and your clients pay, and then you win, right, um, they have to give back to the patient all the, all the private pay money because there's a, there's a, there's a balance billing provision, right? They end up getting their check from Medicare, and it's not worth the trouble. So that's what's, that's, we think what's, that is, I think, what's going on. That is my sense. So to kind of wrap up, and once again, I'm, I'm not giving you answers as far as how, the, the answer right now nationally is GMO hasn't worked, and the folks who brought the case know that it hasn't worked, and they're trying to figure it out. But they are primarily trying to figure it out from a lawyer's perspective. Now, I like lawyers, you know. And, and sometimes you can really get things done through the court, and GMO itself, I think, was a big success, right? But I guess the question, now that GMO is here, is whether we, th this, is, this is really an advocacy function, and we need to be figuring this out a different way. So I guess my, my thought is that at some point soon, um, uh, that a group of us should be having a summit. We should be including folks from the nursing homes, Physical and, physical and Occupational Therapists, the Alzheimer's Association, NALA, and the GCMs, to be deciding whether there is a state regulatory or legislative, but probably regulatory mechanism, right, that could cause nursing homes and VNAs who are practicing in this state to be playing by the federal rules, right? It would seem to me that there is, there is nothing about the fact that they are federal rules that's going to cause that to be preempted or anything. I think, we could figure, we, I think we could figure that out, right? But unless we figure it out, this same game is just going to continue to get played. And I can't, once again, I can't say that there is this easy solution. My sense is that, that, I mean, there are several pieces of this, but one piece is the development of this, this set, th this, this package of care involving PTs, OTs, as well as skilled nurses, 
to, together with a, 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 an acknowledgement from doctors, right, and maybe some kind of standing order that says that for this package of sk care, skill services are required, mm -hmm. right? It isn't, we can just kind of make up this level of, of this level th that you're living in for which those skill services aren't required. And I think the Alzheimer's Association and the other groups that were part of the GEMO case are going to be really interested in the development of those kinds of criteria. So I, so, I would, so I would like you to hear from, from, from Linda and Deb, and then I would like, if we could, to spend a few minutes talking about kind of where to go mm -hmm. from here, right? Because I think these are really, these are very important things. GEMO provides the kind of legal basis for services that are f really important to all of the clients that I deal with who have dementia, like every, that, which is pretty much everybody, you know, just about everybody. And it's the future. For that reason, you've got na major national organizations that want to help us figure this out. And we have the lawyers who did the case in the next state over. So I think we have the ability, and at least for a very short time, we have a blue state here, right? With that we've had, unfortunately, with the, the Duval Patrick administration, finishing up, you know, this may be more problematic next year. We were hoping to be able to try to provide something because we're, mm -hmm. there was such a tie between DePatrick and Obama. But if, if they could talk about their case a little bit, I would appreciate it. This um, daughter, who called very concerned, was given our name by an attorney. Um, she did the first two appeals and lost them. And she wanted to go further. A brief history on this person, he was a 58-year-old man who at birth had a cerebral aneurysm. So he had a, a mental learning disability from birth, but lived a very full life, had uh, maintained a small job, had chores he did at home, lived with his mom, and was a very happy, easygoing guy. Went out to get the mail, slipped and fell and landed on the cement. He ended up at the hospital in Worcester, they examined him. They thought at first he may have had a stroke. He had a long history of seizures his whole life, but was on a very uh, stringent medication program that had kept him seizure-free for a few years. He ended up at the hospital. The doctor thought he had a torn rotator cuff. Put in the orders going to the rehab center that it need to be looked at by an orthopedic surgeon. He also wrote further down that they determined he did not have a CVA. It was a rule out CVA diagnosis. To make a long story short, he went to the rehab center. The transcription of his medical records gave him a diagnosis of a CVA with the right-sided weakness becoming a paresis related to the stroke. Now, the family knows nothing about this because they don't read his medical record. They were denied because at the, the now he goes to long-term care and these medical records follow him, okay? Now, the emergency sheet did come, the original mer emergency sheet that had the doctor's orders to get an orthopedic consult, all of those things. But anyway, he went on rehab there uh, they called the family after how many days, Debbie? Was he 20 days yeah. on rehab and said, he's plateaued. We can't do anything more with him. He needs to stay long-term care, and there's nothing more we can do. So we're going to issue you a denial letter. So like I said, she went through the first two cases. Debbie and I went up to meet the family, and I review, we reviewed the medical record. On reviewing it immediately, I saw the discrepancy with the diagnosis and brought that to the attention of the social worker and the medical doctor. He was with an HMO, which happened to be Fallon, which changed in January to the new name, Reliant. Reliant. But he started the appeal under one insurance company, ended the appeal under another insurance company. And the only reason this plays out is we ended up going to the judge, and you can go yeah. into that. Okay. 
we finally got a date with the administrative law judge, completed all the paperwork. We're all set. You don't have to fly to Philadelphia, by the <laughs> no, way. No, they do anything. it by telephone. It's all all telephone. conference call. Telephone um, or video. They do a lot of video but cases. But you need to understand, the family called and gave me a number of an attorney in Worcester to call, and he would have us at his office to do this phone call. Well, I called, and he was the attorney for Fallon. So <laughs> he said, I don't think you'd be comfortable sitting in the same office as we're deciding this appeal. So with the family member, Linda and I and the family member, we wrote a script. We had everything outlined about, we did a timeline, did a timeline of exactly the circumstances, the high functioning of this individual prior to his fall and very descriptive about the course of events as well as how the family in this situation which was also a piece of this was not given in writing a denial it was from all Fallon. from Fallon only from the nursing home termination yeah. Yeah. Not, 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 not the not. termination notice the termination notice of benefits